study of the play Our Town by the contemporary American playwright Thornton Wilder. But before we get underway, let's look at some pictures. This is a picture of a girl, a human being just like you and me, nothing unusual about her or about the picture. We're still looking at that same girl, but she's farther away and we see her in front of her home. As we move still farther away and up, we can see the whole town of which the girl and her house are a part. This is the state in which the town is located. Somewhere down there, no longer visible, are the girl and her house. We're out in space now, perhaps some 30,000 miles away from the girl, looking down upon the entire United States. And now, from even farther out, we can see the whole world, our world and the girl's world beneath us. Our whole solar system opens up before us, the sun, the moon, the planets. Our own world, the Earth, looks pretty small from here. And now even our solar system appears infinitesimal as we look down upon the galaxy of which our Earth is a tiny unit. And finally, here is our universe millions upon millions of galaxies as far as human thought can reach. And somewhere in this enormous universe is the same girl we started with. Now you may be wondering why I showed you those pictures. What have solar systems and galaxies in the universe got to do with the play Our Town. Well, by the end of this lesson, I hope you'll see the connection. But for the moment, let's concentrate on the play. What's the story of Our Town? Well, it's a story of ordinary life as it was lived by a few people in the small New Hampshire town of Grover's Coast about 50 years ago. In the first act, after the stage manager has told us a little about the town and its history, we're introduced to the townspeople, all going about their daily activities. And in particular, we get to know the Gibbs family and the Webb family. Well, as night settles on Grover's Corners, we have a pretty good picture of the town. People are friendly and no different from people anywhere. Some are successful, some are not. Some are confident of the future. Some have given up all hope. Some are happy, some unhappy. And they think and talk about the same things as people everywhere, the weather, their children, past. Boys like George Gibbs worry about their homework. Girls like Emily Webb wonder whether they're pretty. Nothing has happened that isn't likely to happen to any of us. When the second act begins, three years have gone by. The stage manager fills us in on the changes in town. There aren't many. Everybody's a little older. George and Emily have graduated from high school and they're going to be married. And this is the morning of their wedding. At the Gibbs house, Dr. Gibbs and his wife reminisce about their own wedding many years ago. And at the Webb house, Mr. Webb gives George some good advice about marriage. And then the stage manager appears again. He now takes us back in time, and he shows us how the relationship between George and Emily began. How one day, when they were still in high school, they had a long talk and discovered that they were very fond of each other. Move forward in time again of the wedding, to the church where George and Emily are about to be married. Well, the wedding is just like all the weddings we've ever been to or heard about. The choir sings, Mother Webb cries. George has misgivings just before going to the altar. And Emily gets so scared, she doesn't want to go through with it at all. But in the end, they're happily married. And the guests agree that it's been a lovely wedding. And that's the end of Act Two. Now, Act Three... Act Three takes place in the cemetery, on the hill, 
above Grover's Corners. Nine years have gone by now, and many of the people we met earlier have died. But although they're dead, they're still part of the story of our town. And so the playwright brings them on stage and permits them to speak. Of course, they don't talk like living people. Their point of view has changed. They see life differently now. They're no longer involved in it, no longer really concerned. This is the day of a funeral, Emily's funeral. She and George have been married for nine years. They've had a little boy, they worked their farm and made many improvements on it. But now Emily's died in childbirth, and the townspeople come out to bury her. Like the other dead people in the cemetery, Emily's already beginning to feel differently about life, but she doesn't want to let go of it yet. She wants to relive a part of it to see what it was really like when Emily was still a girl living at home. Yes. And we spent an ordinary day with her. A day just like the one in the first act. But this time, we see everything that happens from an altogether different point of view. Because this time, both Emily and we know how everything's going to come out. It's for Emily, but also a beautiful one. For she discovers what life is really like. And when she returns to the cemetery at the end of the play, she and we along with her have arrived at a new understanding of what it means to be alive. Now, that's the story of our town. I'm sure that as you read it, and as you listened to me retell it, you were struck by the unusual way in which Thornton Wilder presents his story on the stage. You remember in our second lesson, we watched a scene from Life with Father, and we talked about the conventions of the modern theater, the sets, the props, all the things a modern playwright uses to make us believe that what is happening on stage is really happening. Now, this is a model of a stage with the set from Life with Father. How does Mr. Wilder use this stage? Well, first, he doesn't use a curtain. The whole stage is visible at all times. Second, he doesn't use props, stage furniture and things like that. He doesn't even use a set. The stage is completely bare. The stage manager comes out, remember, and tells us where the scene takes place, and he arranges a few chairs or ladders in one case. Something like that. And in effect, he asks us to use our imagination. And then there's the stage manager himself. He doesn't really belong in the story, does he? His proper place is backstage, where he's supposed to supervise the running of the play. But Mr. Wilder has brought him on stage and made him into an important character who comments on the action and tells us all about the people in the town. Now, in life with Father, remember, Mr. and Mrs. Day spoke only to each other. They ignored us, the audience. They pretended that we didn't exist. But in our town, the stage manager not only acknowledges our presence, but actually talks to us directly. Many things happen in Mr. Wilder's play that we know can't really happen. In Act Two, for example, we go backwards in time and we relive events that occurred years ago. Most of Act Three takes place in a cemetery with dead people talking to each other. Not only that, but one of the dead people, Emily, actually returns to life for a day. Now, none of these things could happen in reality. And none of them would happen in a play like Life with Father. We may say then that Thornton Wilder dispenses with many of the dramatic conventions of our time. And in their place, he substitutes other conventions. The bare stage, dead people talking, flashbacks into the past. These conventions seem strange to us at first. But the reason Mr. Wilder uses them is that all these things enable him to tell his particular kind of story better than the conventions of the modern theater would. Well, now we know the story of the play and a little about the way Mr. Wilder presents it on stage. But what kind of story is it? What's our first impression of the play? Well, at first we might think that it's a story about two families named Gibbs and Webb, how their children grew up and got married, and 
how one of them died. But if that's what the play is about, what are all the rest of the townspeople doing in it? And how about the stage manager? What's his part? How about that professor? Remember him in the first act? Professor Willard, who tells us what happened millions of years ago on the land where Grover's Corner stands now? Now, if Mr. Wilder had just wanted to tell us the story of the Gibbs family and the Webb family, he wouldn't have had to bother with Professor Willard, would he? Or with the stage manager, or with all the other people in town. So he must be after something else. Could it be the story of the whole town of Grover's Corners between the years 1901 and 1913? Well, that would explain why Mr. Wilder put in the newsboy and the milkman and the rest of the townspeople. But it wouldn't explain why he put in the stage manager or a whole lot of other things, like the cemetery scene at the end. And then, the play isn't called Grover's Corners, is it? It's called Our Town. That's your town and my town and everybody else's town, too. You may have noticed that the things that happen in the story are the sort of experiences all of us have in common, like growing up and falling in love and getting married and having children and dying. Grover's Corners happens to be in New Hampshire. But the things that happen there happen all over the world. So we might say that our town is about ordinary life, that our town is about all towns. And yet this still doesn't explain Professor Willard, does it? Or the stage manager? Or the dead people in the last act? Well, I think that our town is about ordinary life, all right. But it doesn't show us ordinary life the way most of us see it. It gives us a very extraordinary view of ordinary life. Let me show you what I mean. In the beginning of Act One, the uh, stage manager comes on stage and he describes Grover's Corners in the year 1901. I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll put on my stage manager costume. Here's what he says. The uh, Congregational Church is over there. Presbyterians across the street. Methodist and Unitarian are over there. Baptists down the holla by the river. Next to the post office, there's the town hall. Jail's in the basement. Long Main Street, there's a row of stores. Kitchen posts and horse blocks in front of them. First automobile's going to come along in about five years belong to Banker Cartwright, our town's richest citizen. Did you notice anything odd about that speech? Did you notice that at the end, the stage manager seems to have got his tenses mixed up? He's been talking about the town as it was in 1901. And suddenly he jumps into the future and says, the first automobile's going to come along in about five years. And right after that, he goes back into the past and says, belonged to Banker Cartwright. Well, why does Mr. Wilder have him talk that way? Obviously not out of carelessness or confusion, but for a purpose. What purpose? Well, we might put it this way. When the stage manager looks at Grover's Corners, he doesn't just see the present and the past, like the rest of the townspeople. He sees the future as well. It's almost as if you're watching Grover's Corners from somewhere way out in time. Mr. Wilder doesn't just want us to see the town as it was in the year 1901. He wants us to see far more. Later in the first act, the stage manager brings on Professor Willard of the State University to tell us something about the history of Grover's Corners. And this is what the professor says. Grover's Corners, mm, let me see. Grover's Corners lies on the old Pliocene granite of the Appalachian Range. I may say it's some of the oldest land in the world. We are very proud of that here. Of course, there are some more recent outcroppings, sandstone showing through a shelf of Devonian basalt, and some vestiges of Mesozoic shale. But these are comparatively new, perhaps two or three hundred million years. So now, after we've met the Gibbs family and the Webb family and the milkman and the newsboy, Mr. Wilder suddenly takes us back to a time when there were no human beings on the earth at all, when in fact there was no life of any kind. 
Why does he do it? Why does Professor Willard tell us about the age of the land on which Grover's Corners is located? Well, I think it's because Mr. Wilder wants to give us a new slant on the town and the people in it. He wants to make us see them as part of something very big and enormously old. He wants us to relate Grover's Corners to everything that's happened on the earth since the beginning of time. And he reminds us of this many times in the play. In the middle of Act One, for instance, the stage manager comes out again. And he says, uh, Now, uh, I think this is a good time to tell you that the Cartwright interests have just begun building a new bank in Grover's Corners. Had to go to Vermont for the marble, sorry to say. And they've asked a friend of mine what they should put in the cornerstone for people to dig up a thousand years from now. Of course, they've put in a copy of the New York Times and a copy of Mr. Webb's Sentinel. And we're putting in a Bible and a copy of the Constitution of the United States and a copy of William Shakespeare's plays. You know, Babylon once had two million people in it. And all we know about them is the names of the kings some copies of wheat contracts and the sale of slaves. Every night, all those families sat down to supper, and the father came home from his work, and the smoke went up the chimney, same as here. Well, this speech makes us see a relationship between Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, and the ancient city of Babylon. There, thousands of years ago, People went about their ordinary life, got married, had children, and died, just as they do in our town, and just as they do in all towns. Then in Act Two, just before the wedding of George and Emily, the stage manager makes a speech about weddings. And he says, uh, now in this play, I take the part of the minister. This is a good wedding. People are pretty young, but they come from a good state, and they chose right. The real hero of this scene isn't on the stage at all. And you all know who that is. Like one of those European fellows said, every time a child is born into the world, it's nature's attempt to make a perfect human being. Well, we've seen nature pushing and contriving for some time now. We all know she's interested in quantity. But I think she's interested in quality, too. Maybe she's trying to make another good governor for New Hampshire. That's what Emily hopes. And don't forget the other witnesses at this wedding. The ancestors. Millions of them. Most of them set out to live two by two. Millions of them. Well, that's all my sermon aren't very long anyway. The stage manager calls it a sermon, but most preachers wouldn't mention all those millions of ancestors before marrying a young couple, would they? We certainly don't think of marriage as nature's attempt to put a perfect human being into the world. What the stage manager is doing is making us see this little wedding as part of a vast drama going back millions of years. And with this in mind, we're ready to understand why Mr. Wilder has included the dead people in his story of our town. Here's what the stage manager says about them at the cemetery. Now, there are some things we all know, but we don't take them out and look at them very often. We all know that something is eternal, and taint houses, and taint names, and taint earth, and taint even the stars. Everybody knows in their bones that something is eternal. And that something has to do with human beings. All the greatest people ever lived have been telling us that for 5,000 years. And yet you'd be surprised how people are always letting go of that fact. There's something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. You know, the dead don't stay interested in us living people for very long. Gradually, gradually, they let go hold of the earth and the ambitions they had and the 
pleasures they had and the things they suffered and the people they loved. They get weaned away from Earth. That's the way I put it. Weaned away. Yes, they stay here while the Earth part of them burns away, burns out. And all that time, they slowly get indifferent to what's going on in Grover's Corners. They're waiting. They're waiting for something they feel is coming. Something important and great. Aren't they waiting for the eternal part in them to come out clear? So you see, once again, the playwright is taking us away from Grover's Corners as we know it and setting up the town and its people in a much vaster framework, the framework of eternity. Well, by now we have a very different picture of the play than the one we started with, don't we? We know now that it isn't just a story about a New Hampshire town. We've discovered that it's a story about all towns, about all life, ordinary life. And we've discovered also that the playwright isn't looking at ordinary life the way you and I do. Mr. Wilder presents parts of the play in close-up, like the scenes between Dr. and Mrs. Gibbs and the scenes between George and Emily. And that's the way you and I see life, in close-up. But then he suddenly takes us away from this close-up picture of people and makes us see their lives and our own lives also, as if we were looking down on them from a star way out in space. He wants us to see our lives in the framework of the universe and of eternity as he himself puts it. He wants to make us feel the contrast between each tiny moment of our lives and the vast stretches of time and place in which each individual plays his role. Now, most of the time, we aren't aware of this contrast. We're too involved in our daily lives to think about eternity in the universe. But there are times when we all do feel it perhaps when we're looking at the stars or at the sea. It's at moments like these that we feel with a sense of awe, the universe and eternity expanding around us. And it's something of this feeling that Mr. Wilder gives us in his play. There's a passage in the play that makes this clear. You may remember that at the end of Act One, young George Gibbs and his sister Rebecca are watching the moon together. And here's what she says to him. I never told you about that letter Jane Crowfoot got from her minister when she was sick. He wrote Jane a letter, and on the envelope, the address was like this. It said, Jane Crowfoot, the Crowfoot Farm, Grover's Corners, Sutton County, New Hampshire, United States of America. And then George says, what's funny about that? And Rebecca says, but listen, it's not finished. The United States of America, continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the solar system, the universe, the mind of God. That's what it said on the envelope. What do you know, says George. And Rebecca says, yep, and the postman brought it just the same. The address on the envelope starts with Jane Crowfoot. It could be your name or mine. And then the address expands until it takes the whole earth, the solar system, the universe, and finally the mind of God. At the beginning of this lesson, I showed you some pictures and I promised you that at the end of the lesson, you'd understand what they have to do with our town. Let's look at them again. That's Jane Crowfoot, you see. It might be you or me or any human being. are a way of locating Jane Crowfoot in the vast framework of the universe. Exactly as the envelope in the play located Jane in the universe, and exactly as the whole play locates all of us in the universe and in time. Now, why does Mr. Wilder want to do this? Is he trying to make us feel small and unimportant? Well, that can't be the point of the play, because when we finish reading it, we don't feel small, quite the contrary. 
we feel larger, we feel strengthened. Why and how the play makes us feel larger is part of our next lesson. But till then, I'll give you two sentences to think over. Both are by the Frenchman, Blaise Pascal, a great writer and mathematician who was deeply concerned with man and the humanities. This is the first sentence. The eternal silence of these infinite spaces terrifies me. Here Pascal is saying that man feels small and frightened in the infinite universe. But the second sentence suggests an answer to the first. Man is only a reed, the weakest thing in nature. But he is a thinking reed. You think about that. It has something to do with our next lesson in which we're going to talk about the things we get from reading our town. The things that helps us to find out about life and about ourselves.